Well, everyone, I think we can start now. It's five minutes past two o'clock. Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We appreciate that you made the time to join us here today. Uh, as I've said, it's 5, uh, 14.05 South African time. Uh, we really appreciate you having joined us today for this uh, webinar. My name is Sichaban Fuki. I'm a young professional so representative of young professionals in the groundwater division, Gauteng branch. Uh, we are very excited that you've joined us for this webinar where we are, uh, our speakers are going to share with us uh, their research and present for us their focus on uh, acid mine drainage and mine water or uh, mine related water. In this, uh, in their presentations, we will learn more about uh, acid mine drainage. Is acid mine drainage the same as uh, mine uh, affected water? Is it the same as mine water? Perhaps they, uh, their presentations will answer to those questions. Can we use uh, treated mine water for uh, our daily use for municipality water supply, irrigation, and other uses? Perhaps these presentations will provide us with those answers. Uh, Today we have two presenters here who are going to present for us in the name of uh, Prof. Christian Voskander, who's a member of the Academy of Science South Africa and has a 32 years experience uh, in the field of uh, uh, geohydrology. He is a mining and geothermal hydro uh, hydrogeologist specializing in mine water tracer test, mine water geochemistry, and remediation. Uh, Prof. currently Geothermal Hydro South African Research Chair for Acid Mine Drainage Treatment at the Tony University of Technology in Pretoria, and is the president of International Mine Water Association. Together with uh, Prof. is uh, Ms. Elga Mugova, who is a PhD candidate at uh, a university in Germany, and she conducts her research at the uh, South African Research Chair Initiative, is a chair for mine water uh, management, and is a member of the Executive Council, as well as a treasurer for the International Mine Water Association. Uh, healthcare uh, specializations are hydrodynamic processes in flood mine, uh, underground mines. Prof. Without a further waste of time, uh, you may take the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sajaba, for your kind introduction. And um, that's exactly what a lot of people do when they cannot say my name. They just call me Prof or Chris. So you 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 are in a very good uh, accompanying ship um, because the name is in fact quite long and not very usual here in South Africa. So thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Um, both me and, and Elke. Um, esteemed audience, dear colleagues, dear friends who are listening today, um, Elke and I, we will in fact talk about mine water. And uh, the title of our presentation is very South African, Aish. is that acid mine drainage? And we will give something like mine water 101 to you. So at the end, you know, at least what we consider as acid mine drainage and where do we have um, mine water or mine drainage. So the first slide that we want to show you is giving you um, a little bit of an overview and it's a little bit of uh, a question for you. And the question is, which of the next slides are really acid mine drainage? So here you see a selection of slides and what we made sure is that all the water looks a little bit reddish or does not look reddish. And while I'm speaking, you can think a little bit which of the six slides that you can see here is acid mine drainage. Sure, let me start. That one is acid mine drainage. It's in Perm in Russia and it has a pH of 3.5. That's what you very likely might have expected. 
This one here is in South Africa, and I'm not allowed to say where it is. And the pH of that water, it's of course coal mine water, is between 1.5 and 2.5, depending on where you measure. The next one here is also acid mine drainage, and you probably wouldn't have expected that. It has a pH of 5.5. The iron concentration is not too high, and therefore we don't see the red color. But still, it has a pH of 5.5. The next one here is from South Africa. That's 18 Vins in the West Strand. And a lot of people claim that the water flowing out there is acid mine drainage and the treatment plant is called acid mine drainage treatment plant, but pH of 6.5 is clearly no acid mine drainage. The next one here is Germany. It's called the Ventilatorstollen in Bavaria. pH is 6.7, but possibly you would have said that's also acid mine drainage. It's not acid mine drainage because it has a circumneutral pH of 6.7. Let's come to the last one. That's also in Bavaria. And I once was called when I was at Munich University and people said, oh, we found acid mine water, we found mine water, but it's not mine water. Um, it comes from a boggy area and the pH of that water that you can see there is 8.1. So what we want to tell you here is even if it looks like mine water, even if people think that could be acid mine drainage, it's not necessarily acid mine drainage. Therefore, let's come to a couple of definitions. Let's come to a couple of words. And a lot of words are commonly used in publications or when we are just speaking with each other. So here are some of those words. Acid mine drainage, that's in the title, you know that. Mine water, that's what we usually use when we are just speaking generally about mine water or mine drainage, it's the same. In publications, we, or we is our team, only writes mining influenced water. That's a term that has been introduced in the 1990s for water where we don't know if it's acid or not. And finally, if it's not directly coming from an underground or surface mine, we commonly call it acid rock drainage. So let's have a look to that. So mine water is pH uh, independent. The same for mine drainage and mining influenced water that is pH unspecific. So you can use it for every type of water. And of course, when we have acid rock drainage, then that is usually acidic water that comes from natural sources or that comes from waste rock dumps. Now, move your eyes a little bit to the left again on that slide. What is acid mine drainage? Because there's a definition for acid mine drainage and that definition is pH dependent. Acid mine drainage is only mine water with a pH below 5.6. So you cannot speak about acid mine drainage when the pH is 6 or 6.5, because that's not how it has been defined internationally. When the pH is above 8, we call it alkaline mine drainage. And the nicest master thesis that I ever saw was treating acid mine drainage with lime. And he had a table in his master thesis where the pH was 8.1. That's clearly not acid mine drainage. But what is in between? In between, between roughly a pH of six and a pH of eight, that's what we call circumneutral. And that's not something that my team brought up. That is a terminology that is used worldwide, has, for example, been defined by the Guard Guide or by Kirk Nordstrom. Now, how are we forming acid mine drainage? That's a question that you might ask yourself now. And we are starting with some nice minerals. The above mineral that you can see here, that is marcasite and the below one that is pyrite. So these are two of the three desulfide sulfides that are forming acid mine water or mine water. But what's happening in the next step? The next step is we need water, we need oxygen, and we need a catalyst for those processes. And the catalysts in our case are microorganisms that you can see there. They are speeding up the process by one million times. That's, that's a lot. And only these two on the left side, plus pyrotite, only those three minerals are causing acid mine drainage, nothing else. And the result is, you can see it here, the upper one is a mine site in Germany, which uh, with a pH of roughly seven, so it's not acid mine drainage. And the lower one, you saw it before, that's here in South Africa, not that far away from, um, from where we are. And that has a pH of, let's say, roughly two. 
I know most of you don't like equations. That's the reason why I want to show it to you without a single equation. So this is what's happening when we get acidic water, acid mine drainage. For those of you who prefer equations, let's have a look to the next slide. What is the pyrite weathering process? And you can see from the arrows, it's not a simple process. And the relevant literature for that is always Singer and Stumm 1970 and Stumm and Morgan 1996. You should not cite any other relevant or irrelevant papers when it comes to the formation of, uh, when it comes to the pyrite weathering process, because they were the ones that defined it, not defined it, that found how it works. We start with pyrite. We're adding water, you saw that before. And now we have two pathways. Now I'm using the mouse, this one and that one here. Let's first look to that one. When we add oxygen to pyrite and to the water, then you get the sulfate here and you get the iron. And the green one here, that is called ferrous iron. That's iron two. And here are the protons. And you know, protons, that's the acid. So that's what we get here. So that reaction forms acid. Then we have another reaction. Uh, it's this side here. When we already have um, S2- in our system, then we can also oxidize with the help of ferrous iron, our pyrite, but the final result is the same. Good, that are the first steps. Now you see here, there are a couple of more steps. So what's happening there? So we have a slow process and a fast process. Let's first have a look to the slow process. When we are adding water to the iron two, then our iron two will oxidize and our ferrous iron here will become ferric iron. That's what we can see here. And then what happens that ferric iron here reacts again with pyrite here and forms again ferrous iron plus the protons plus the sulfate. So that means, for example, when you look to that side here, you can even produce acid mine drainage without oxygen. Once the process started, you get that cycle. But that's not the end. The end is what you can see here because that further reacts with uh, water and oxygen to hydrolyze. And this is then the, the red precipitate that we see in acidic or non-acidic mine streams. And be very careful when that happens, even a circumneutral mine water, and we just had that recently at Simmer and Jack mine uh, in Germiston, the water that we sampled had a pH of seven and in the lab, a couple of hours later, it had a pH of two because the iron hydrolyzed. And as you can see here, it produces acid, produces protons. So this is the process that you need to keep in mind when we are speaking about mine drainage and acid mine drainage, because these are the reactions that are occurring. Now you might ask yourself, what are all the problems that are caused by mine water? First of all, we hear that quite often, heavy metal pollution. But esteemed audience, we must not use the term heavy metal because it has four zero, 40 different definitions. And when people are writing about heavy metal, I never know what they mean. The nicest definition is music. So are they writing about music <laughs> pollution? Uh, that's a little bit funny. No, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry clearly said already many years ago, we must not use the term heavy metals anymore because it's absolutely unclear what is meant. So the terminology that you should use instead is semi-metal contamination of water courses. That's what happens. And our streams on our lake then get um, contaminated by mine water discharges. What else do we have? The receiving water quality decreases. So if the mine water drains into a lake or a river or a stream, then the mine water quality, then the water quality substantially decreases. We will see a negative influence on the aquatic ecosystem, but it's not the mine water itself that has that negative influence. No, when the oxyhydrate, so when that hydrolysis starts, then the floor of the lake or the floor of the stream will be covered 
with that yellow boy or whatever name you want to give it. And there, microorganisms cannot live anymore. And the microorganisms are the starting point of the food chain. So it's not that the water is toxic to the fish. It just avoids the fish from going into that area, swimming into the area because there's no food anymore. Then we see, and that's what, what you know and you saw it, we see a, a change in the visual appearance. Red water and precipitates will occur. And in many cases, we can't use it as drinking or irrigation water more. When we look to the influence on groundwater quality, for example, in boreholes, mm, there we are not absolutely sure. We have no absolute proof that um, mine water negatively influences drinking water. There's one case in the US that we know, sorry, in the UK that we know, but in all other cases that we investigated, we could not find a proof for drinking water contamination by mine water. Now, let's come back to South Africa. What you see here is a map that some of you might know. It's a map from the Mine Water Atlas that has been uh, initiated by the Water Research Commission. And it shows you which watersheds in South Africa are in some way negatively influenced or just influenced by mine water. And at first sight, you might say, oh my dear, that looks bad. But have a look to that red watershed here. It's the whole watershed. So if there's only one mine that is polluting the water or that has polluting water, then the whole watershed will be red. So it looks much worse than it is, the situation. Nonetheless, meaning that is we need to take care of the water. I will show you some examples. So that's just the legend. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Let's have a look around through South Africa and I will give you seven examples of mine water discharges in the country. And I will always tell you if it's acid mine water or not. That's the first one. That's 18 Vins in the West Rand, just near Krugersdorp. And you already remember it had a pH of 6.5. That's not acid mine drainage. This one is near Emalaklini. It looks completely different meanwhile because they are remining the area, but the pH of the water usually had a pH of three. So there is clearly acid mine drainage because there are no buffering minerals around. This one here is also broadly in the Malaklini area, pH of two to three, as you can nicely see here from the very red color. This one here is again near Imalaklini. Uh, the mine water that is discharging here had a temperature of around 35 to 40 degrees Celsius because the coal seams were burning in that area. So that um, is also acid mine range with a pH of roughly three when it still existed. This one here is the Nestor gold mine that's near Sabi and Pumalanga. And you think that the water looks so clear and clean, but in fact, it's not. The pH of that water is also depending on how much it rained around pH four, highly contaminated. But because the iron concentration is low, we don't see the red color. Next one is one that I like quite a lot. It is the Faninel discharge also in Pumalanga near Carolina. And um, again, we have um, very low pH values around two. So clearly also an indication for acid mine drainage. Let's jump to Bulembo. Sorry, not to Bulembo, that comes later. Let's jump to Barberton. So that is um, um, a lake just downstream, an abandoned gold mine. And you can already clearly see from the signpost there that the water quality must not be very good. In fact, it was highly polluted. Now you think that all the mine water discharges in the country are highly polluted. So let me provide you with a good example. Therefore, the green arrow. That is the drinking water supply in Sabi in Pumalanga. Because um, some of you might know, Sabi is one of the cities, villages, places in South Africa that gets drinking water from an abandoned gold mine. So not all mine water is necessarily acid. Not all mine water is necessarily polluting 
and there are some mine water discharges that have such a good quality that you can even use it as drinking water. And now, Elke, my uh, colleague Elke, will give you an introduction of what the research team is doing and some outlook for the future of mine water research. Thanks, Christian, for handing over to me. So you, you learned a lot now about mine water and um, what what um, what are the basics. But the question is, and now I just need to um, change my screen here a bit. What can be done? So first of all, it is important to understand the situation and to understand which problems are there. And for that, we need to investigate the situation to understand the problems. How can this be done? By geochemical um, investigation of the geochemical composition of the water, water testing, then to understand the hydrodynamic situation, for example, if there is density stratification, and to have a look at the longevity of the mine water quality. The term here is first flush. Because it's not the case that the mine water that discharges from the flooded mine, that the quality is the same quality over months, years, or decades. It changes. And this is very important to keep in mind, in mind, especially when we look at mine water treatment. Now, there's intervention in different phases of the mine life cycle. It can also be done during the mine flooding or even before the term is in situ remediation. For example, the density stratification that exists in most mines can be influenced. I will come to this a little bit later. And then when the mine water is discharging, treatment needs to be done in the cases where the water quality is not good enough that the water can be discharged in the next water course. So this can be active mine water treatment. You see on the picture the new wall treatment plant. This is the conventional site, but they also have reverse osmosis and freeze crystallization there, just that you heard a few terms about active treatment. And then when the water quality is not that bad anymore, passive mine water treatment is possible. And the third point of what can be done is monitoring and aftercare, because usually you can't just forget about the mine and the mine water that is flowing out. And remember, I told you something about the first flush, that the water quality is changing over time. So the water needs to be monitored and aftercare needs to be done. Here on the picture, this is the control room from the Emalachleni treatment plant. Now, examples of research that we are conducting with our SACI chair at TOT. First of all, water sampling and water analyzing is a big point. So we go either to the flooded mines and we take water samples from the mine pool directly, or we go to the point of discharge and take water samples there. Usually we measure the on-site parameters, which are pH, temperature, Oxygen, oxygen concentration, redox potential, iron 2, iron total, acidity, and the flow rate. And we also take samples, filtered and unfiltered, and send them to the lab to analyze them. And we analyze main ions and trace elements. Another investigation method is to take depth profiles. Electrical conductivity and temperatures are the main parameters. And I will also talk about this during the next slide. Then tracer test. Tracer test is something awesome to do with mine water. Let me show you just some nice colorful pictures. Analog modeling. We have the Agricola model mine here in our lab in Pretoria. Very awesome way to do mine water research. Numerical modeling with computational fluid dynamic software. And our colleague, Cariso More, he is working with artificial intelligence, which is quite a new field in mine water research. I promised I will tell you something about depth profile measurements. 
on the picture on the right side, you can see our colleague, but he is not holding a probe for the depth profile. He is holding a camera in his hand because before you go down into the shaft with your very expensive probe, you should check if the shaft is free and if there are not some locks or whatever um, is inside the mine. So usually we go down with the camera first to check if the way is free and if it's safe for the probe to lower it down. And then we use our probe um, the other picture is for size comparison. And with this probe, we can measure temperature, electrical conductivity, pressure to have the depth and the pH value. And I would like to show you a picture or an example from South Africa, but unfortunately we don't have good cross section. It's quite important to compare the profile with the cross section. So this is an example from Portugal, where we measured in 2019 at a former uranium mine. And you can see three profiles. Let's go from the left to the right side. On the left, side is the red profile on the y axis always the depth and on the x axis it's the temperature and you can see that there is a big jump between two water bodies the upper water body has a temperature of about 19 degrees celsius the lower water body after the jump let's call it jump for now has a temperature of 23 degrees celsius so there is a huge difference of four kelvin then the profile in the middle, this is the electrical conductivity. The upper water body has electrical conductivity of only 800 microsiemens per centimeter, which is not that bad. But then look at the lower water body, an electrical conductivity of over 4,000 microsiemens per centimeter. And you can see this is a huge, huge, huge difference between these two water bodies. And then the curve, on the right side, this one is the density curve because it's also called the density stratification because of the density differences that cause the stratification. And this curve is calculated with the UNESCO equation from temperature and electrical conductivity. I told you it's important to look at the cross section. This is the cross section of that Portuguese mine. We measured at the Santa Barbara shaft and we lowered down our probe until about 500 meter. And I said before, we have water bodies. So look here. This is the lower water body with the high temperature and the high electrical conductivity. And we started to use the term warm mineralized water body. And then there's the upper water body and we use the term cold fresh water body and these terms uh, are coming from ocean science and now very very important the water oops sorry very important to show you the water discharge is here at shaft p4 and the water quality that is flowing out of shaft p4 is relatively good and the water can be treated with passive mine water treatment plant because the water that is flowing out of shaft P4 is only fed by the upper water body, this cold fresh water body CF with the relatively good quality. So you can see the importance of stratification. And we figured out that stratification occurs in almost every mine or coal if there is no interruption, for example, by pumping. Now tracer tests, just three really nice colorful pictures. This is a tracer test at the Bless Box Brute in East Trend, and this was done for ingress investigation. Then this is a tracer test in a settlement lagoon in Germany from an abandoned and flooded coal mine. And the idea was to check does the settlement lagoon work properly. And as you can clearly see, no, it doesn't because the water is taking shortcuts and um, something needs to be done to improve the um, time the water stays in the settlement lagoon to improve the iron removal. And then another picture, you can see that props also can work. And um, this is in a flooded underground ore mine in Germany and we are injecting fluorescent dye 
into the flooded mine shaft via a pipe, but um, we also we are also able to inject the tracer at a certain depth inside the flooded shaft exactly at the location where we would like to have it. So and then when the trace is injected at one point of the flooded mine, we usually measure at the discharge point the concentration, but also the time it takes until the trace arrives. So it's a very nice method either for underground mines, but also for mine water at the surface. The Agricola model mine, analog modeling. This is the Agricola model mine. It's a six by four meter large analog model of a flooded underground mine with four shafts and four connected levels. It's here in our lab at TUT in Pretoria. And I would like to explain the last experiment that we are conducted at the mine. It was a tracer test. This is the inflow. So the entire, we flooded the entire mine before, and then we have a continuous inflow rate of 15 milliliter per minute. And we injected a hose in shaft number four and used the end of the hose, um, lower down there, let me just use the mouse again here, to inject the tracer. Most of the tracer accumulated in the shaft sump looked like this. You can see it with a UV lamp because it's fluorescent dye. But then we wanted to see how is the tracer distribution and will the tracer flow to the discharge point and how long will this take and how much tracer will we have at the discharge point. So we took samples at the sampling ports along the flow path with syringes. And as you clearly can see, the one that is very green for a this is an example, or sorry, this is, an, this is an example from the shaft sum. And then we also measured at the discharge point the concentration of a tracer with a fluorometer. Now you probably have a question, why are we doing this experiment? We are preparing for a large tracer test in Europe where the two shafts are 20 kilometers away from each other and where 100 kilogram of tracer needs to be injected. And this is a huge test and you cannot just repeat it if something goes wrong. So we pre-test here in the lab and actually we found mistakes because in our first approach, we lower down the hose too deep and then all the tracer was stuck in the sump. And yeah, if this happens in the real test with 100 kg of tracer, well, not so easy to repeat. Now the last slide, which Chris and I think is really important to talk about, because when you hear about mine water, you think, oh, a lot of problems are there with mine water or with acid mine drainage. It's always seen so negative. But let's talk about valorization of mine water. Mine water can be used uh, as drinking or irrigation water. An example is an Emala Schlenie. It's used as drinking water, the treated mine water, of course. Geothermal use, heating of buildings, for example, done in Springfield in Canada. Hydropower, there are past examples from the Harz Mountains or the Ore Mountains in Germany, but there are also visib 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 oh, visibility studies um, in Spain or also in South Africa. Pumped hydropower, there are also studies be done in South Africa, but there's always a bit of a risk with earthquakes. So very good investigation needs to be done before pumped hydropower is applied. Green energy, micro or mini turbines. Here a picture, just, to can, just, just that you can imagine what I'm talking about. And I think micro or mini turbines are a great way to use relatively cost-effective mine water but we did not find any example currently. Mine water as a resource, for example, for raw earth elements, everybody's talking about, but to our knowledge, it's just in the lab stage, but definitely a great idea. Post mining use of landscape can be done with open pit mines, but also with underground mines. And I have a nice example from South Africa, uh, for you, so a few weeks ago, I was with my kids at Gold Reef City in Joburg, and they told me that they use the pumped mine water for their water attractions, a very nice use of mine water um, in post landscape. 
And they also help in spa applications, for example, radon enriched water in Bad Gastein in Austria. So these were examples from South Africa, but also worldwide. But now South Africa has a lot of mine water, but South Africa also has a big potential to use the mine water. And I would like to show you this here. This is, to our knowledge, the point where South Africa is using mine water for these purposes. So a little bit for drinking and then irrigation water. They're also doing lab experiments about mine water as a resource and post mining landscape. I gave you that nice example. But there could be so much could be so much be done with geothermal use, with hydropower, with microturbines. So please don't see it in a negative way. See it as a potential and that a lot of research and a lot of applications are there here in South Africa. And now a few helpful resources, because this was just an introduction seminar to mine water and so much more can be told about it. So there are organizations that deal with mine water. Thanks to Groundwater Division, we could give the webinar today. Then there's the International Mine Water Association, where Christian is the uh, president and I'm the treasurer. And we have the association itself, but we also have an annual conference. The next one is in June in Wales, in the UK. Then Visa has a mine water division. Then you can check the mine water atlas, or if you want to dive deeper into the topic acid mine drainage, please check out the guard guide. It's available online. Then Christian, he has 32 years of knowledge, why not use this? You can check his publications or publications with colleagues on the website. And you see on the picture his latest book, Mine Water Treatment. Um, it's now also available in English. And next week on Sunday, um, on Monday we will start, but until Sunday, so an entire week, we will go with our team to Bulembo in Iswatini. And we still have one free place for the excursion. So be fast, scan the QR code, and you can participate um, in our excursion. And if you're really interested in the topic of mine water, and I personally think it's awesome, you might want to join our team as a master student or as a PhD student. And if you're still considering, just ask a few questions now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elke and Prof, for wonderful and eye-opening presentations. Uh, I've really learned a lot and got reminded of a lot that I might have forgotten. Uh, but I still have a few questions that I've noted down here, but I will allow the attendees to ask as well. So I won't ask a lot of questions. I'll just ask a few from what I've noted from your presentations and then allow the uh, attendees to ask the questions if they have. They can also drop the questions on the chat box and we'll read them to you. Uh, to our presenters, I've heard you say the treated mine water in South Africa has only been used in one municipality, I think uh, Malasheni or as Sami. What, what could be the reason for other mining areas uh, not using the treated water, the municipality not using it for uh, potable water uh, use since we are dry uh, country and we're having a lot of problems with water? Or is it that the mines are reusing it for their processes, hence they not? possibly giving it to the uh, municipality for treatment and then use for potable water use. Yeah, that's, uh, that is one reason. That's absolutely true that um, some mines are using it internally. Um, for example, the new Val mine water treatment plant, they are using it internally and they are uh, supplying it to a close by cold fired um, um, electricity plant. Um, but I think that another reason is that people are in fear of the mine water. They think that mine water is dangerous and they cannot drink it. Um, but millions of people around the world are using treated or uh, untreated mine water when the quality is good. And um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a perception in, in the mind of the people that they are not that happy to use mine water. And that's also the reason why we spoke about it. We want to make sure that people know 
once mine water is treated, it's not toxic anymore. Uh, the mine water is not radioactive anymore once it's treated because the radioactivity is not a property of mine water like the temperature um, or the density um, because the radioactivity comes from uranium, thorium, potassium. And once a mine water treatment plant removed these contaminants, then the mine water is not radioactive anymore. So that are mm -hmm. some of the reasons that we think or that we are aware of. Yes, yes. No, th thank you for the response. Uh, to our attendees, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or uh, jot your question on the chat box, then we will pass them to, to Prof and uh, LK. Yeah, you should take you should take the chance because now we are here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, while they still maybe uh, thinking of the questions or drafting the uh, the other one, I heard you talking about LK was referred to the tracer test that the, you guys are performing at your lab. Yeah. Do you have any program or a module that you're using to analyze your data? So the, the, for the tracer tests in the lab, um, the data is not that much, and we just use Excel. If you have a pro with Excel, Excel, then you can use Excel mm -hmm. very nicely. Because um, the samples I take from the sampling port, these are eight samples every day. So if you run it over three months, it's not that much. And although yeah. we record the concentration with the fluorometer every five seconds, it's still manageable to um, read out the data or process the data with Excel. So for the, uh, for the AMM, it's fine and you can use other programs. But then if you want to work with other colleagues, it's difficult because they don't know the program. So Excel is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what Elke spoke about was mainly the storage of the data. What you asked was how are we evaluating the results? And yeah. that's of course something we are not doing with Excel. Um, there is a lot of nice programs out there. Uh, with a lot, I mean two. Uh, one <laughs> is from the US Geological Survey. That's called uh, QTracer. That's from Malcolm Field. And the other one is from French colleagues, which is called uh, Tracer. And the disadvantage of these two is that um, mine water does not behave, or mine water tracer tests uh, do not behave as uh, groundwater tracer tests. We have a lot of peaks, which are the result of um, internal waves and double diffusive flow which you usually don't find when you have Darcy flow from a groundwater tracer test. So I tried to use it. Um, I used both from Malcolm Field, the software, and I used also the French software. But for mine water tracer tests, I'm not very happy about that. So what we do is we use um, a simplified method that was introduced in Germany and Austria already in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, which helps us to, to interpret the data. But if we want to go into the details, that means if we want to know the dispersivity, if we want to know the dispersion rates, then of course we need to, we need to identify individual and single peaks, mainly the first one, and then we can use the software that I spoke about. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, before I go to because I can see his, uh, his hand uh, raised there. Let me ask a question from the chat box because the message are moving fast, I might miss it. Uh, Tirello is asking, okay, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, treated mine effluent tends to have high salinity. Is there a way to neutralize the acids without increasing the salinity? Um. <laughs> um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? The acid comes from the protons. The protons are extremely small. So you cannot just use reverse osmosis to get rid of the acid in the mine water. So you have so far, we, we always have to add something to the water to neutralize the acid. 
it would be great if we could do it like microorganisms. Microorganisms have something that is called proton pump. And with that proton pump, they are pumping the protons inside the cell. And then inside the cell, those protons are used to produce ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And you know that adenosine triphosphate is what all living organisms need to produce energy. Um, this is an idea that uh, I have. Uh, that we should use proton pumps, but I think that's, uh, that's two generations of researchers away. Um, so at the moment, I'm sorry, Tirelo, um, if we want to get rid of the protons, we need to add alkaline material at the moment. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Aston, I see your hand is up. You can, you can shoot. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, just a quick question. Um, uh, in your research, is a cost benefit analysis being looked at, you know, for, for getting, you know, the buy in from, from municipalities and settlements where these mines are, are, are happening? Um, you know, just, just, to, just to talk around that in a sense. Thanks. Oh, thanks for the question. Unfortunately, I had never time to make an MBA. So uh, that's simply no, we don't do that. Um, we don't have the expertise here in my team that is done by other people. We have to give it to other people who are experts in that. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Kwasi, uh, I can also see your hand there. Can you, you can see it? Thank you, Sichaba. <clears throat> Uh, I had uh, Chris, do I call you Chris or Prof? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, had, I'm easy uh, going when it comes to that. You can call me Chris, you can call me Prof. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, you were saying that, uh, that so far, you've, you, you've seen one case where um, AMD has impacted groundwater or bowl water in the US. So I was just Are wondering, is it? You have gone or UK, yes. You, is it because I'm just wondering whether you've gone to do the investigations and found that the, the groundwater is not, I mean, the AMD is not impacting the groundwater in many cases, or is the fact that you have not done a lot of investigations in these kinds of uh, environments? Okay. Um, yeah, we did a lot of investigations in the past roughly six years, and we were specifically searching for cases, not only in the literature, but also in the gray literature. We asked colleagues if they know cases where mine water was negatively affecting drinking water. And I'm specifically saying mine water because the case in the UK, it's not acid mine drainage. We try to avoid the word because a lot of mine waters are not acid mine drainage. So um, we didn't find a single case. It could be that the mine water is negatively affecting groundwater. That's what we see from time to time. But that groundwater is normally not used as drinking water. And that's what I was speaking about or what Elke was speaking about. We don't see cases where the mine water is polluting drinking water. In the case of the UK, it's sulfate. Uh, sulfate is not really toxic to us. It just makes us run to the toilet when the sulfate concentrations are too high. It has a taste that some people don't like. But if you drink, for example, Pellegrino, that Italian mm, mineral water, um, that has a composition that is in parts very close to mine water because it has very high magnesium and sulfate concentrations. Some people like it, others don't like it. Um, what we are doing in our analog model, we are also trying to find out what can we do to understand the process? What can we do to get mine water into aquifers? But so far we were not very successful in doing that. Uh, not that we don't know how to do it, but we could not negatively influence the aquifer. We needed extremely high energies to do that. And high energies in mine water means that we would need pumps um, or that we would need high temperatures. When we increase the temperature to roughly 40 degrees Celsius, then we saw some negative effects, um, but there are not many mines in the world where you regularly have that hot water. So I hope um, that quasi 
answered um, your question. Yes, that clarifies the, 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 the issue actually. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Kwasi. And if you have more questions, Elke showed us our email address. We are happy to share more information. Uh, okay, before we leave, uh, the, there will be a, a questionnaire that we will uh, request of the attendees to, to fill. Please don't leave it uh, before uh, filling the questionnaire. And there was this other question. Okay, it's not really a question, but I think it's a clarity from uh, Masofana Chwani. He wants to join on the full trip. I think Elke said we can scan the, uh, the, the code there, but also provide the email so maybe uh, Chwani can communicate with you via the emails or the, the scan. And yeah. I'm not sure because uh, I saw the other. Okay, where is the message now? It's Maud from Malaysia. They will also like to join the field trip. Oh yeah, uh, pleasure. Is it possible <laughs> to assist? <laughs> is it possible yeah, to assist I wish I, I wish I from come there. Malaysia to join me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I I gave another course a couple of uh, weeks ago, and there were two colleagues from. Japan that attended the course. So I think that's more or less the same distance. Yeah, yeah but maybe from uh, some flight, maybe Malaysia is far. From... If you come yeah. to Southeast Asia, let me know. Yeah, send me an email so uh, that sure. I know who you are. Um, your mode, is that correct? Yeah, Shazwan. Yeah, exactly, Shazwan. Send us an email. Sure, no problem. And just, just a quick advertisement here. Um, of course, you can also join the International Mine Water Association. Um, or if you just want to have a quick look, you also could uh, check out our LinkedIn page from the International Mine Water Association. Prof, I'm not sure if you can hear. I'm struggling to hear. I didn't hear anything. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, Nokula. Awesome. No Kutula, sorry. Um, yes, Prof. Now I was just saying, um, I'll email Prof directly. I see in the chat box um just after he said that if you have an inquiry regarding the field trip, just email him directly. So it's not a problem. Thank you. Pleasure, mm. pleasure, absolute pleasure. Well, uh, in the absence of any other questions, I would really like to appreciate uh taking your time to attend here and learning and asking questions as well. It was very interesting and informative uh, session that we had here. Hopefully when you had other sessions, you will respond as you responded to this one. Thank you all. Please uh, don't forget to fill the session feedback. Thank you. Yeah, Sachaba, we thank you also and the Groundwater Division for giving Elke and me the opportunity to speak today. And uh, you already mentioned uh, you would like to see also Mine Water 202 or 301, I don't know. <laughs> um, so just contact us and we can assist. OK. Uh, OK, I thought there were no more questions since the time. Uh, is, that's William. But it seems William. Sorry, Sajaba. William is there. Is. Hello, good morning, yeah, Prof. Thanks for your presentation. Hello, good morning, Prof. Thanks for your presentation. Please, Thank you. Good uh, I have one uh, one question. I would like to know how we can effectively effectively and sustainably develop uh, prevent uh, long term acid mine drainage. I would like to know because I'm I'm permanently working. Uh, exploration uh, mining companies and we have a lot of, of this problem we can observe a lot of this problem in uh, some mining zone so i would like to know how we can develop some method or implement some method to effectively uh, prevent long-term acid mining drainage yes thank yeah. you Thanks, thanks, William, for the question indeed there are a couple of measures uh, that can be done if it's a, a waste rock pile or a tailing stem, you can use dry covers or wet covers that has been researched all around the world. And that is usually done. Um, 
that you need to make sure that the mining company still exists, of course. If the mining company got bankrupt, it's, it's very hard to do that. In most legislations, uh, you have the, uh, it, it's compulsory to properly remediate your mine site before you can get any other, um, any, any other permit. So that's number one. Number two is if you have an underground mine, you flood the underground mine. I showed you the example from Portugal, from the Ucharicha mine. Uh, this was just one of many examples. We meanwhile studied in detail 60 examples worldwide. And in most cases, we can clearly see that uh, the CF layer is above the WM layer, which means you have good water quality on top of bad water quality. So over time, after the first flush is over, that helps you to improve the quality of the water as well. Um, when you have uh, a dewatering edit and your mine is above the dewatering edit, you can use dams to build up some water behind the dam, but be careful. You might remember the, uh, the gold mine, uh, the copper mine um, in, in California that um, released uh, a lot of acid mine drainage a couple of years ago because they made a small mistake. And um, a colleague of us said in one of his publications, there is only one way to prevent acid mine drainage, and that would be not to mine at all. So William, I'm very sorry. We always will have it. Um, we cannot completely prevent it. People tried it with a lot of methods, flooding a mine with nitrogen gas, for example. I think we don't want that. Um, using bactericides in the water. It only lasts for a couple of weeks and a couple of months, and then the microorganisms are um, adapted to the bactericide. So that does not work as well. The key thing is proper post mining management with companies that are reliable and companies that know what they are doing. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I see in the in the chat there is currently a discussion about um, constructed um, wetlands. That's absolutely true. Um, when the acidity of the water is not too high, and please, there's a difference between uh, acid and acidity. Acid is just the protons. Acidity is the protons. It's the metal acidity plus the organic acids. So if you have acidic mine water, highly acidic mine water, then you would have a huge area of land available to use constructed wetlands. And for that water, we are not using constructed wetlands anymore. For that type of water, we are using RAPS systems, R-A-P-S systems. And the first one has just recently been constructed here in South Africa at the Carolina site, uh, where the Council of Geoscience constructed a RAPS system. So constructed wetlands, someone used them near Emalaklini, not knowing that constructed wetlands per se can not be used for acid mine drainage. Constructed wetlands can, normal constructed wetlands can only be used for circumneutral mine water. When you have uh, acid mine drainage and you just use a normal reed bed constructed wetland, the water will get more acidic than it was before because of the hydrolysis of the iron. Um, so reps is the solution or what is called an anaerobic constructed wetland. Sorry, that was a, that was, that was a second presentation now, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> but I saw that in South Africa, a couple of people already made constructed wetlands to treat acid mine drainage, but it's not possible. It's not possible. Yeah, You cannot use an aerobic constructed wetland to treat acid mine drainage. It simply does not work. Thank you, Prof. I think, okay, if there are still some questions who, from people who are still here, maybe they, might, they can ask, but I think most of the people are 
uh, completing the, the questionnaire now because it seems there are no hands, there's no interaction in the chat box, but we will wait and see if they are still people who are in the webinar yeah. and sharing their views. Yes. Yeah. And then I'm I'm reading in the answer from from Crystal that um, constructed wetlands can remove salinity. Um, this is only partly true. Again, it's for anaerobic constructed wetlands. Anaerobic constructed wetlands can remove part of the sulfate, but they cannot remove, unfortunately, they can neither remove sodium nor can they remove fluoride concentrations. So if you have deep um, water from, from coal mining, which has usually very high concentrations in sodium and chloride, unfortunately, any type of constructed wetland also would not work. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reading more of uh, Crystal. What Crystal is absolutely correct, uh, what he's writing here. There are some uh, very, very nice examples in the UK where mining companies first used active treatment and um, at the discharge of the active treatment plant, then they installed um, aerobic constructed wetlands. That's really a nice solution to do the, the final polishing at the end of an active water treatment plant. Yeah, Elke just so made a short. Uh, Elke must, uh, just made a short note here. She said, um, "Mine water 202 could be a presentation about mine water treatment, so that you all would know which technologies can be used for what type of mine water." That will also be interesting. Yeah, just uh, interesting for you. Model TUT is. Is it open for everyone to come check and analyze or see what kind of absolutely. model is it? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is it absolutely. open anytime? Or less yes. To... Naya, at two okay. o'clock in the morning, I would say, ah, oh, that's not a good time. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. during normal working hours, yes, you just give us a shout, and then we will explain you what we are doing at the moment. And if you're coming up with a good idea that you want to study and we can do that, then of course we can do that together. That's absolutely easy. So it's located here, the city center or the main campus? Yeah, it's uh, Acadia campus in, okay, okay. at the end of, uh, of the bank area in Nelson, Mandela, in Nelson Mandela Drive. Okay. Yeah, then I think William asked another question here. Uh, how can we recover critical metals from polluted mine water or polluted water? Um, that's exactly what Elke already pointed out. A lot of research is done, really a lot of research, but so far no single application is available to remove them. Why? Have a look. You have 55.5 moles of water in one liter of water. And out of these 55.5 moles, you want to remove 0.5 moles. So you're removing more or less nothing from a lot. And that's exactly the problem that we have. Um, there's currently research going on about selective membranes. So these membranes would be selective for some critical metals, um, but it's, it's it's research. I think we are still away a decade until we can really do that. And you're right, William, this extraction process could create other problems. Um, there is a very nice technology that was developed in, in the US. Um, and that is with liquid-liquid uh, extraction. Uh, extraction. Mm -hmm. And to, to do that liquid-liquid extraction, you need a highly toxic organic liquid. And I agree with you, William, you could cause other problems when you're using liquid-liquid extraction. Now I'm starting to wonder if uh, attendees are still online or they've forgotten that they were online. Ah, yeah, <laughs> I, I saw that. 
Because they're still in quite a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps they've forgotten that they didn't leave the meeting. That could be. And we are still here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, maybe I, I should have asked this while the webinar was still carrying on, because it's one of the questions that I have noted here, but I forgot to ask it. With regard to density stratifications, uh, are there any factors affecting the uh, how do I put it? Uh, the factors contributing maybe to the mindfulness with regard to the stratification itself? Yeah, so in my in my PhD thesis, I exactly that was exactly the topic of my PhD thesis: stratification and flooded underground mines. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, investigation about stratification in flooded underground mines was done since the nineteen sixties, but never really paid attention to it in detail. Yeah. Although it's such an important topic, as you could see uh, just with that example um, of the Portuguese mine. And there are factors or influences that destroy stratification. So as far as we know, during the flooding process or shortly after, in most cases, in most mines, stratification occurs naturally and mostly at the uppermost connected level or gallery. But now, if you hang a pump inside the mine and you pump the water because you want to keep the mine water level low or you want to treat the water, you destroy the stratification because the natural system is not there anymore. And then you destroy the stratification. And obviously, you do not just pump out the water from the upper water body in most cases. You destroy yeah. the entire stratification. And then the water from the lower water body is also. Um, pumped out and therefore you get a very bad quality and we have examples in South Africa where we saw this quite clearly. Um, yeah, and this needs to be considered and for example, it, one thing is like pumping for treatment purposes, but the other example that needs to be considered is pumping for geothermal use. So it's it might be a great idea to hang pumps inside the mine water to use the hot water for geothermal applications. But by this, you might destroy the stratification and then the good intention to recover geothermal energy or heat is destroyed by mine water with bad quality that needs to be treated. So uh, yes, yeah. it, when pumping is considered, investigation needs to be done and water samples can't not just be taken at the water surface of the mine pool. Uh, stratification, a depth profile needs to, be, uh, um, needs to be done to see what's really going on inside the mine. And um, yeah, to destroy the stratification might have very bad influences. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, if we do not have any further questions to, uh, to our presenters, then we have filled the the questionnaire. We we can we can leave the the sorry we can leave the the webinar session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to you as well for allowing us to, to be here today. Thanks for providing the platform and to all of you have a good afternoon and we are hoping to see and hear or read from you very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.